Hello, uh, my name is Amy Boynton, and for those of you who don't know me, I am the chair of the Young Georgians, and my research focuses on women of the 18th century, and specifically what women built during that era, which, as my PhD showed, was actually quite a lot. And today I'm going to be talking about Teresa Cornelis, or Corneli. She was an Italian-born opera singer who moved permanently to London in 1759 and soon enjoyed a meteoric rise to fame and fortune. She is famous for having taken London by storm during the 1760s and the 1770s with her lavish subscription balls and concerts for the nobility and the gentry. So observing the success of outdoor entertainments enjoyed by the Beaumont during this period, um, such as those at Vauxhall and Ranley Gardens, which you can see here on um, these two prints, Teresa spotted a lucrative opportunity to create an indoor equivalent. Thus, with the help of John Fenmore, who, her lover, she leased out an outdated, um, um, she leased out the outdated 17th century Carlisle house based in Soho Square. And she transformed it into a, quote, fairy palace for balls, concerts and masquerades. Um, with the help of Elizabeth Chudley, who was a maid of honour to Augustus, Princess of Wales, Teresa was able to attract the highest echelons of society to her gatherings. So, to, um, with Elizabeth Chudley, Elizabeth sat at the head of a committee of ladies, and these ladies decided who, um, were, who was able to attend, um, what people had to wear, and essentially it was a big uh, party for their friends. But obviously this was perfect for Teresa because everybody wanted to attend, everybody wanted to be part of the group, part of the it crowd. So, um, these early gatherings at Carlisle House proved to be so popular um, that Teresa decided to purchase the lease of the house and then she embarked upon a whole scale um, enlargement and remodelling project. So the principal purpose of the works was to demolish the adjoining buildings at the back of the house and to replace it with a new building which was to contain a large concert room on the first floor um, with a supper room underneath, uh, which you can see here in this drawing. By all accounts, the exterior of the new building was unremarkable constructed um, simply from brick and roofed with Tavistock slate. Instead, it was the interior that was to be the focus of Teresa's creative efforts. In addition to the new concert room and supper rooms, the building project also created a, wait a waiting room, um, a music room, two tea rooms, a large card room and a yellow waiting room. So, two waiting rooms as well as a renovated uh, marble hall and grand staircase within the old part of the house. The scale of the rooms were astounding, intended to impress from the outset. And the concert room was of course the most remarkable of all, with symmetrically lined windows on the north and south walls drawing your eye to the east wall at the end, which um, had a magnificent coffered semi-dome. Uh, this impressive architectural feature crowned the space um, for the orchestra, which was raised on a wooden dais. So when it was completed, Teresa's assembly rooms were celebrated and exalted, serving to increase her fame for further. She held assemblies once or twice a month and played hostess to the most prominent names in society. Such was the general approval of Teresa's assembly rooms and her ability to orchestrate extravagant balls that Kalar House was often chosen as a venue for grand society and royal events. Here, as you can see, is one of her tickets that entitled one man and two ladies to attend one of, one of Teresa's balls. It's priced at five guineas, which is approx approximately about £540 in today's money. And such, so these were expensive tickets, and yet she constantly sold out. And um, 
there was such a jam around Soho Square with all of the carriages, chases and sedan chairs dropping people off that she actually implemented London's first ever one-way system where she said that the um, head of the horses had to face towards Greek Street dropping off the guests and then continuing on. Um, but that just gives you some indication about her popularity or the popularity of her balls and concerts. So, um, a reflective account of Teresa's aesthetic taste was written in 1790 by a Prussian tourist who had visited during the height of Teresa's fame in the 1760s. He writes, The magical genius of this woman, woman knew how to vary her entertainments in a thousand different shapes. Sometimes she exhibited colonnades and triumphal arches, grandly illuminated. At other times she metamorphed her apartments into gardens planted with walks of orange trees and adorned with fountains, inscriptions and transparent paintings surrounded by garlands of flowers and variegated lamps of a thousand different tints. A whole suite of rooms were richly furnished so as to intimate the manners and luxury of foreign nations in the Indian, Persian and Chinese styles while 9,000 wax candles, placed with great art, um, produced a fine effect to the spectators. So here we can really see how innovative, uh, innovative Teresa really was. In other accounts, there are mentions of grottos and Chinese bridges, further indicating how adventurous she was with her architectural and aesthetic endeavours. During the mid-1760s, however, um, there was the threat of the opening of Almax, which was a rival assembly rooms. And so this prompted Teresa to embark upon a succession of further improvements to Carlisle House. And in 1765, she placed an announcement in the papers, which stated that, quote, it is said the alterations and additions to Carl Carlisle House, together with all the new embellishments and furniture, adding thereto by Mrs Cornelis, will this year alone amount to little less than uh, £2,000, and that, when finished, it will be by far the most magnificent place of public entertainment in Europe. Now, £2,000 is approximately £205,000 in today's money, which indicates how much money she was making during um, this period and how much she was lavishing back into the building. So this enabled her to really be experimental with her architectural designs and the aesthetics within. Indeed, to entice her subscribers further, in November she placed another tantalising announcement in the papers, and she writes, We are told that Mrs Cornelis, among her other elegant alterations, has devised the most curious, singular and superb ceiling to one of the rooms that was ever executed or even thought of. So, although we have no idea what this ceiling looked like, it clearly indicates that she was determined to continue to attract new subscribers as well as her regulars to her balls by creating the most magnificent interiors that was ever seen. So, um, although of course she wrote this and she wrote it in superlative tones, it is interesting and definitely, um, it definitely hints at the fact that her taste was remarkable. And indeed, there are other contemporary accounts that say that she was the arbiter of taste. She was the leader of fashion in everything interior, well, with everything to do with interior design. Anyway, um, Teresa's ability to constantly push aesthetic boundaries of the time ensured that she remained superior within the entertainment industry. And indeed, she successfully fought off that threat from Almax. Teresa became famous amongst high society, with Casanova remarking that as well as her having a country house in Hammersmith, she also had three secretaries, 32 servants, six horses, a mute and a lady companion. Um, now Casanova was um, one of her lovers, indeed when she was still in Italy they had a child together called Sophie and um, Teresa brought Sophie along with her to London and she lived there at Carlisle House with her before she went off to a Catholic boarding school. So, um, 
Sadly, however, despite Teresa's continued conspicuous display of wealth and grandeur, in reality she was facing bankruptcy, and by 1772 her creditors finally caught up with her. Her atrocious, and I mean atrocious, grasp of financial management resulted in her confinement in the King's Bench Debtors Jail, with her house and its contents being seized and um, her creditors organised a hasty uh, auction of all of her possessions. And so despite years of um, buying and designing and creating, it took hardly any time to disperse that amazing legacy. However, although she did return to Carlisle House um, to ma manage assemblies and concerts for her creditors in the following decades, she never um, was able to replicate the great successes of the 1760s. And sadly, um, plagued by um, continued debts and increasing competition, Teresa's heyday was gone. And she eventually, tragically, ended up in Fleet Street Prison, where she died destitute in 1797, aged 74, from cancer. And so that is the end of my brief talk. Um, I hope you enjoyed learning about Teresa as much as I have enjoyed researching her and telling you about her.